great to be with you. Um, I really, uh, I really enjoyed the program to date. Uh, Bill and uh, especially the Center Stage Theater was phenomenal, uh, and I want to thank them again for their performance. I was informed, actually, uh, Mr. Ginsburg, that the session will be the Will and Stefan Stage Theater. <laughs> well, I'm very, very glad it worked out the other way. Um, but uh, truly, regarding uh, Will Ginsburg, I simply have to say that uh, you all are well acquainted with his leadership of the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven. I've had the good fortune to know Will for decades now, uh, and he serves as a, uh, a remarkable counselor and advisor and friend, uh, and uh, was one of the moving forces behind education reform before there was reform. Uh, so I'm very, very grateful, and institutionally I'm grateful to the Foundation for all the investments that you've made and all the work that you've done to make this moment possible. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about our, uh, our experience and our initiatives here in Connecticut. I'm going to talk a bit about um, the New Haven experience as well in the context of doing so because I have to say there's no more appropriate place to be talking about reform than New Haven, both in systemic reform uh, at the district and um, its innovations that sur uh, surround us in this community, charter school, uh, magnet school, and otherwise. So I'm going to uh, get into the details now. Let's see if this works. It doesn't. Here we go. Um, the the, the beginning of my talk is to, is to speak to you of the, the achievement gaps, plural, uh, in, uh, that we are experiencing in Connecticut. You know, too often when we speak in Connecticut, I think we speak of a single gap. We are actually uh, in the midst of two. Uh, the first gap is Connecticut as compared to other states. Um, Connecticut has always been and continues to be towards the top of states in the United States. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, we are slipping in our performance relative to others. Uh, now, you've just heard in the description of my bio uh, some of the states that, I've been for, that I have recently traveled in and worked in. Um, and if you look at the most recent round of NAEP scores, which are the national exam scores, you'll see uh, that on, uh, on eighth grade mathematics, uh, way too many uh, states are passing us by, but among them, I will note for you, are New Jersey, my last state of residence. It is a very, very fine state, but I insist that we beat it. Uh, Massachusetts, which has uh, basically been at the very top or close to it on every indicator that we have a lot to learn from them. But also, uh, I'm here to report, Texas, South Dakota, and North Dakota have eclipsed Connecticut on eighth grade mathematics. And you begin to wonder, uh, what is it in the way of investments and strategies that they are doing that is eclipsing the state of Connecticut? In grade four reading, in fact, we are doing quite well. There are maybe three states that are exceeding uh, our ranks if you look at the NAEP scores, once again, the national exam scores. These are now the aggregate scores. But I want to meet, move to and talk about the second gap. And the second gap uh, pertains to uh, free and reduced uh, lunch students, economically disadvantaged students, students in poverty, students of color. Uh, in our state, uh, we are not uh, nearly doing well enough. I'm going to get into greater detail about this, but if you look at at the fourth grade reading scores, uh, we see that, uh, in fact, we're, whereas we were getting beaten by three states uh, on the overall indicator, there are 17 states that are outperforming Connecticut. Uh, if you measure uh, the performance of our lower income students across such states, uh, this is not an acceptable level of performance, and there's simply no good explanation for it. Then if we look at the achievement gap as, as a measurement of the gap itself, um, I realize everyone was eager for a table early on in my presentation, so here it is. Uh, but uh, the, while appearing dry, unfortunately these are, this is a profound problem that we view. Uh, the achievement gap, if you categorize it as the black-white gap, the Hispanic-white gap, the free lunch uh, and all students gap, um, and if you look at fourth and eighth grade reading and mathematics, um, you end up with 12 boxes, which you see behind me. Um, in seven out of 12 boxes, we have the largest gap in the United States of America. In all of the boxes, we rank in the top 10. So it is fair to say uh, that we have the largest achievement gap in the country. Um, this is a situation that 
should not stand and cannot stand. Um, and the question is, how can we remedy these gaps? Well, what can we do that, to ensure that we don't slip relative to other states, that we in fact catch up where we have slipped, not on all indicators uh, in overall aggregate performance, but on some key indicators. We saw the eighth grade mathematics uh, scores, for example. And how, how can we remedy this gap that is within our own Connecticut society? Well, we started to do a lot, and I'm grateful to Will for his explanation of the momentum that we have generated. Thanks to the work of Governor Malloy, who um, has been absolutely invaluable um, and immutably committed uh, to education reform, uh, and uh, to the terrific partnership of the General Assembly and the work that you all have done over the years, uh, we are on the map again as pertains to progress rather than merely as pertains to gaps. Um, and we have put, uh, put forward an agenda that is getting us started. By no means is the, the completion of an agenda, but it is getting us started. Um, and it has resulted in meaningful legislation. I'm going to describe some of the components to you um, and explain to you why school reform is front page news and is a go. Um, here in our state of Connecticut. Um, to explain the story, as I referenced quickly, we have to look within Connecticut and look at the, the energy that's already being generated by our communities here, the innovations that are, uh, that are bubbling up, um, and specifically our three largest cities. Um, if you look at uh, the reforms that are occurring in New Haven, um, they are uh, truly uh, generating momentum um, and getting the job done. I'm very grateful to the leadership of Superintendent uh, Reginald Mayo, who is here, uh, and Assistant uh, Superintendent Garth Harris. Um, Reggie and Garth, together with the entire NHPS team, uh, have created one of those models that people around the country look at as one of collaboration between administration and union, uh, and one that is uh, making real progress. Um, most recently recognized by the federal government with a $50 million award for innovations around the teaching profession, inclusive of uh, teaching, uh, teacher leadership positions, uh, something called the Teacher Incentive Fund, um, and um, across the board from teacher evaluation through to school turnaround, through to the Boost program of wraparound services, and Sue Weisselberg is here, does a wonderful job with that. Um, New Haven is making uh, remarkable progress. Um, it's being generated up in other cities, and it's catching on from city to city in Hartford, uh, across two generations of superintendents and, um, and dating back even further, but especially across two superintendents, uh, Steve Adamowski and now Christina Kishimoto, uh, Hartford is making remarkable progress. A portfolio strategy of managing schools, agnostic as to uh, the management model, the, uh, the uh, specific instances of K-3 uh, reading investment and ensuring that in the early grades reading is uh, a priority and going well beyond into innovations that really matter, and then Bridgeport. Uh, Bridgeport most recently has joined the ranks of the reform cities, um, and uh, as our state's largest city, under the leadership of Paul Ballas, is making uh, tremendous strides um, in establishing a standardized curriculum, uh, in establishing early college experiences for high school students with real partnerships with area colleges and universities, uh, with creating safe corridors uh, so that the, uh, the secure environment for learning is unquestioned, uh, and many, many other uh, innovations. Our three biggest cities are centers of reform for our state and indeed for our country. These are tremendous assets, and uh, in the near future and over the medium and long term, we are going to make even more partnerships possible, and we are going to ensure that these reforms uh, don't just get maintained but are truly extended. Um, and again, I'm, I'm thankful to, uh, to Reginald Mayo, also for his mentorship over the years in helping to make this happen. So let's talk about what we're doing uh, on a state level to build upon these individual cities' reforms uh, and the investments that you all have made at the municipal and district level uh, to, to expand the energy and to truly uh, create a reform dynamic in our state. Uh, one of the terms uh, that I wish to use um, in explaining this uh, phenomenon to you is the, is the Connecticut way. For far too long, I feel as if, and I know you join me, 
um, the school reform dialogue has been divisive. Um, there's been um, pe uh, people, advocates, uh, reformers, um, constituencies uh, taking the position on the left or the right, uh, aligning with administration or union, uh, taking a, a, a truly ideological position to the point of uh, that you are almost speaking of theology, um, that it, these are beliefs that cannot be altered. Um, and the reality is uh, that there are answers everywhere and we need to draw upon them. And uh, that's what we call the Connecticut Way. In early childhood, what does our big bill and new budget do uh, to uh, enable reform and progress in our state? Well, first of all, in times of austerity, in times of uh, budget contraction, not only in Connecticut but across the country, the governor has seen fit in the General Assembly uh, through its efforts to expand by a thousand early childhood slots uh, across this state. Simply, uh, uh, it simply started up between the month of June when the bill passed in final form uh, and August. Um, remarkable turnaround, remarkable uh, expansion of childhood, early childhood opportunities. But uh, the expansion of high quality uh, uh, daycare doesn't happen by chance and the, the monitoring of early childhood quality experiences needs to occur. So the recognition that we have uh, is that we need to, no matter the caregiving circumstances, no matter the venue or the setting, uh, we need to ensure that early childhood is delivered well uh, with uh, a, an attention to quality. So we've established something called the Tiered Quality Rating and Improvement System, or TQRIS. I know that rolls off the tongue. I expect to hear everyone referring to that. Immediately following this TQRIS. Um, I, we, we have uh, temporary tattoos that are being issued to carry on your skin. It's very, very important. Uh, but the reality is that beyond slot expansion, we need to ensure that we have uh, the maintenance and, in fact, the enhancement of quality. We need to uh, rate the quality of care wherever it's given, whether um, at home, whether in a church basement, whether at a YMCA, whether in a school setting. Uh, and that's what we intend to do. That won't be easy. That won't be overnight. It will be a multi-year process to set up the infrastructure to do it. But we need to do it, and then we need to make the investments to ratchet up the level of care wherever it's given and wherever the starting point is. That ladies and gentlemen, is the Connecticut way. We expand and we maintain even enhanced quality. <clears throat> school and community. Um, it's often pointed out very accurately uh, that the school can't do it alone. What about the role of parents? What about the role of families? Uh, many of you in this room have been uh, advocates of this position. Absolutely true, but all too often there hasn't been a meaningful way for parents to engage. So we've invested in something called parent universities or parent academies. Uh, New Haven has been one of the innovators on this front as well, where uh, parents can actually position themselves through learning about techniques to advocate and also to, uh, to participate in education right in their own homes. Um, so that's one move. Another move is to recognize that some parents can't make it to a physical location in order to get more engaged. Very important that we continue to commit ourselves to school governance uh, that makes sense for parents and involves parents. It's very important that we have parent-teacher nights that we have parent universities, but we also have to provide information to parents where they are. So we're creating direct connections through electronic means or door knocking means or phone call means or whatever it takes. So we have a parent technology pilot that will help provide real time information to parents on student progress through text messaging and through old fashioned methods like I mentioned, like door knocking and going beyond. Much more to come on this front. School and community together, that's the Connecticut way. Measuring progress. For the longest time, the standard for achievement in Connecticut has been referred to as proficiency. Um, it's a relatively low bar in the gradient of performance as measured on standardized tests. Um, very important that students do achieve proficiency, but the reality is that when Connecticut established its measurement system, it had something called GOAL. And GOAL was considered to be the college and career readiness standard, a higher level of attainment that wasn't achievable for all students. And the reality is that what we've done over the years, uh, partly uh, because we've been latched on to No Child Left Behind, um, is that we've measured only progress across that proficiency cusp, just across that mark. Uh, but the reality is that students' growth from even the below basic level to the basic level, uh, beneath the level of proficiency, and above proficiency, uh, ranging through goal to advanced, all of those moves by students, all of that progress should count 
under NCLB and the way it was constructed, it didn't. Now, the way we measure, measure progress is that wherever students are, whatever attainment they achieve, it counts in our system of measurement the way we judge schools, the way we make investments, the way we hold ourselves accountable. That's the Connecticut way. School funding. For the longest time, we have all bemoaned the over-reliance on property taxes, the inequities in the system. Even in this time of austerity, Governor Malloy and the General Assembly saw fit to invest more in education, $50 million more in the big bill and budget. And they saw fit to, to ensure that $40 million of that investment went to the 30 lowest performing, highest poverty districts among the 166 in this state. These so-called alliance districts, because the state is now forming an alliance with these districts, uh, these highest poverty, lowest performing districts, to ensure that they set forth strategies in meaningful plans that they can carry out in the years that go forward with these investments to ensure the highest possible and best possible use of these, of these dollars. And we can have confidence in continuing to invest and to remedy uh, fund, funding inequity. Um, so more funding, but also more accountability and more strategy. That is the Connecticut way. We've also uh, recognized that we have uh, wonderful, comprehensive K-12 educational systems in our state. Um, we have some that need significant improvement. Um, but much of the attention has been focused, focused on our comprehensive system, our uh, traditional board of ed K-12 system. We also have systems like the vocational technical system uh, that really have been in the, in the background and some would say the backwater uh, at the very moment where Connecticut employers are telling us, even in the recession, that they can't find Connecticut residents to fill job vacancies. Uh, we also have other uh, key systems that have represented real innovation in our midst and have inspired greater progress beyond, including the charter schools here in New Haven and beyond, including Mackin schools, especially in the Hartford region, also in this region, uh, including the vocational uh, agricultural system or the agricultural science system. We need to make more investments in all these areas, and we have, as pertains to charter schools in particular, where we've seen some of the most dramatic growth for students in, in poverty and for students of color. Uh, we've made significant per pupil increases uh, to ensure that there's greater equity in the amount of money that's being allocated to these systems. So, comprehensive system, the VOTEC system, and other innovative systems. Investments across the board to ensure uh, the continuing progress, that's the Connecticut way. School turnaround. The uh, prospect of turning around a school that for many years has been failing on multiple indicators, has simply not been graduating students who are college and career ready or ready for the next step in their education. It's a difficult one. The history of turnaround uh, in, our, in our country uh, is, is not good. In the state of Connecticut, um, there are uh, well over 100 schools across our state that have been by No Child Left Behind standards failing for five years or more. Now, 100 is in one sense a big number, but it's also a cognizable number. We can identify where the schools are. We can get involved where they are. Well, that is the new way. That is the Connecticut way. We are not standing by the sidelines anymore as a State Department of Education. Instead, we are actively identifying those schools that are in need of turnaround, that are the lowest performing, and we are engaging with the districts to help them both through uh, the real investment of dollars and through the provision of flexibilities uh, so that um, any rule that exists uh, on that school campus can be flexed to ensure progress. So what does that mean? Well, here in, in New Haven, what it's meant is that Dr. Mayo and his team have put together a plan um, for the high school in the community. The high school in the community is a fine school. It has seen some dips in recent years. Um, it is uh, not one of the highest performing high schools in the state, but it, it ought to be. Uh, it ought to be certainly en route to high performance um, through uh, one of the highest rates of progress in the state. Uh, well, out of recognition for that, the New Haven District has partnered with the union, the New Haven Federation of Teachers, uh, there's a, a long history of teacher activism and teacher leadership uh, at high school in the community. Um, at HSC, the union has actually taken over management of the school. 
that the union is serving as a management partner to operate the school. In Hartford, Connecticut, one of the lowest performing K-8 schools, Milner, Milner School, uh, likewise has been identified for intervention uh, and for turnaround by the state working in partnership with the district. In that instance, a charter school with a strong track record, Jamoki Academy, uh, which is uh, a, uh, a real treasure in our state, has stepped up to take over the operation of the school. Um, and they're making real strides. I was just walking through the halls and through the classrooms of that school this week. Um, real transformational difference that you can view uh, in the before picture versus the after picture. Uh, a union operating a school, a charter school, uh, uh, a, a charter school organization operating a school to turn it around. Whatever it takes, agnostic as to the model, um, not focused on the, uh, the theological grasping at uh, the a particular philosophy or uh, the holdings of the organization involved. That is the Connecticut way, and that's what we're going to see more of as we advance this agenda. There's been a lot said about um, the importance of teacher evaluation. Uh, you may have noticed in the course of the debate about the big bill uh, that there was occasional mention of teacher tenure. <laughs> Um, you may have noticed that there was dialogue about teachers. I'm going to talk about that explicitly. Uh, uh, one of the things that's important to note, and that gets lost in all of the storm and drop, uh, that the storyline seems not to contain, is the fact that the model for teacher evaluation um, has been established, uh, and that's been established collaboratively. There was a, an organization called the, uh, the, uh, the Performance Evaluation Advisory Council, or PEAC, PEAC, that included representation from unions and management alike, uh, from higher education, from superintendents and principals, um, and together uh, they formed a model for evaluation. Um, instrumental to the idea of evaluation in our case is the fact that the setting forth of goals for teachers in the classroom in order to enhance performance and practice is to be conducted collaboratively at the classroom level uh, through uh, a joint setting of student learning objectives and beyond. In addition, the emphasis is on the provision of support for the vast majority of teachers who are doing well but want to do better and need to do better. Um, the provision of support that's specifically linked to evaluation data, that is informed by that data, uh, and that is tailored to a teacher's practice in the classroom. Coaching models, embedded models, that's the wave of the future. That's the way it needs to be. Instead of the, the auditorium style of instruction, this case notwithstanding, of course. <laughs> um, that's the way for the future. That's the way we need to move. So evaluation and support wedded together through collaborative process, that is the Connecticut way. And when you hear about the fact that tenure has been reformed, which it has, um, and you hear about the fact that effectiveness must be earned as a status in order to earn tenure, um, and that the ineffectiveness standard is now the standard for dismissal, you understand that it's tied to an evaluation and support system that is meaningful and that is collaborative and that will be more fair and more uniform across our state. That is the Connecticut way.